Um, I just want to start off with a big thanks to everybody who took part in the last live. Um, so for those of you who don't know about the Canada Fair Project, um, this is a three-year project funded by our Uh, our main goal is to get that population stat. How many of these were endangered? How many of these were endangered species at a ICN scale? And we have no idea how many. That's the main goal. Uh, looking at trends for these birds as well. Um, and then looking at threats and effects of population. We know that uh, plants that are out of control, um, kind of habitat, habitat change affecting these birds. Uh, that's another thing. And then having that usage for what are these birds eating, uh, where are they moving, uh, what kind of sites are they nesting at. Uh, and a big part of that uh, was getting the citizen scientists to work with us. So even though the project is done, we still have to have citizen scientists going out and collecting data to see what's going on. So we want to do that. That's really important, especially for the next few years. And then what I'm really going to focus on today are the management. And hopefully we can get into that as we get through the discussion period after the um, So we already kind of mentioned it. Uh, this is just a historical trend of these birds in Texas. So these birds are dead and continuously every year before our first Texas is dead. So that's the kind of thing. And these are changing. Uh, every year after that, there's more and less recent birds in Texas. Um, you can see the big population. Big thing in the state of California. Um, 
comes to management and when it comes to the question of what's going on, what's changed over the last four or five years versus the last two decades. And now we're at The other thing that we've been doing with the town here in the last few weeks in July, August, September, we can tell the difference between the and our birds. That helps us get really reading success. So every single year, we can get value wide reading success, and we can do this on a city basis. The amount of juveniles that are being brought in is not going to be And we really quickly need to be that thing is, we're not going to be studying the overall nesting birds, but we can do some nesting stuff. Obviously, that happens in the last few years. Um, but uh, the founder nest has, of course, achieved a lot of money and money. But the last few years, we're going to do some nesting stuff. Um, so, our results over the last four years, you can see our juvenile percentage is about 15%, only 5% of our lives. 15% in 2017, that has. And you can see our, our total bird check. Obviously, we're double counting birds. The more we're counting these birds, they're, they're closer to the actual bird. Um, and so I was in the valley during the time of the second in 2019. And looking at the City by city basis. Um, we have a four year average of 20 percent. Uh, in 2016, you can see all, all of our cities have an average of four, including the general, are above average. Uh, and interestingly, all cities drop. So if one city is doing really bad and bringing down the average, there's something with weather, something with that, um, their natural environment, how, how their population levels bring them down. 2018, they all increased again, right? And in 2019, they have McAllen and Brownsville that actually increased a little bit in the Harlem and in the Air West area. Uh, the other interesting thing, uh, Harlem did is above average every single year. Brownsville and McAllen are below average in the time of the We have something going on that's happening in Brownsville and McAllen. Market or these people who uh, so just tell us how much we're there. Um, and something like that. Um, these are kind of cultural things that we're doing. Um, so, looking at even our recruitment results, um, overall, we've had pretty healthy recruitment compared to other populations. At a higher level, which is good. Um, so we've had a consistent trend too, so when we look at this, uh, our recruitment data, um, and we've stayed around that 20 percent uh, of the uh, uh, increase in the year. Uh, we do have some disparities in the city between the top of the island, about 70, but it's kind of the same top here going to all the different cities. So I don't think one the actual differences, though, um, we have next slide to the future. Something that's really cool about the next topic is that they have a natural history that is on the back of the topic today. We're going to be monitoring this for the years to come. You would expect more next slide to be the next topic. So we um, would see that getting from those junior hours is going to be on the back of the topic. Coaching, obviously, playing a big role. And then there's other things to think about sleeping medication, medication we think is more things that are in the getting really excited, pointing at wild trees. Uh, 
Um, so moving on into some, some mechanical kind of analysis that we wanted to do some
keyword data type. So many good actions for coaching before the laws that are protecting the environment. I think that I gave them the part of the city to be. I think that We can do things like a uh, billboard and stuff like that. Uh, really good. Really good. Uh, 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 
contributing back to the guidelines. So obviously we will be more more private, but especially where we can really do something about it are not being a cat We've been going through an HMD and saying things like that. Those are the most important things. We can jump into a state transition. We can add things like that. I'd like two or three minutes of questions. Okay. Uh, so, those are great questions that we should uh, discuss in the future. So, does anybody have a quick question or two to sign up? We've got two or three minutes. Hey, can anybody hear me out there? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I can't hear you guys at all. I've been listening, and fortunately, I know a lot of what you're trying to say, Simon. Hi, this is Don Brightsmith. Um, is there anybody near the speaker who could speak to see if it's actually just a bad connection um, or if it's just that it's too far away? Is somebody near the computer who could say something to me? Can you hear better now? Uh, that's close. I can almost understand, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, again. I'm right next to the computer, so it fits. Okay. Not being close. Okay. I think you're the only one that's listening in, so. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Okay. Do you have a question? No, I just wanted to see, because if, if there are some questions, I'd like to hear them. Um, sorry I couldn't make it. I had some medical issues up here, but. Um, we'll probably get in more to it in a half an hour. I, yeah. So uh, side to side, not the other side. So here, this is the top. These two sides, and this is the other. Hold on one second. Okay, Susan's with the American version. Guys. It would be great if they could put the that microphone, whatever it is, near the near the speaker for this one. I'd like to hear. If not, it's okay. But right here. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just amazed to see some of the things that Simon found out and some of the things that. that is planning and doing because in many ways the findings, the uh, the trends and well, not so much the trends but the things that need to be done are very similar to what we found in one of levels with this two year study that we just finished. And so I don't think I'm gonna take up all the 30 minutes but I'm gonna try to you know give some time for questions and 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 just to, make, just to make sure that we understand what, what happened there. Uh, this map right here is just to kind of show you uh, where the study was conducted. We are somewhere, are we? Yeah, somewhere right here along the US Mexico border. So this study took place in central Tamaulipas, uh, very close to the capital city, Ciudad Victoria, right here. And we decided to go with this particular area because this is the southernmost portion of the Rio Grande joint venture geography. We couldn't go farther south because of you know, the limitations that we have as far as where we can actually work. And so, and this also happens to be one of the core areas for native populations of red crown parrots within its normal range of distribution in the world. Uh, and then of course you, you all know the status of the 
the species by different women's species. On the side. I tried to use the arrow. There you go. Okay. Now it's working. So the, the general objectives, oh, before even I get into that, we were able to do this project because we received a grant from Fish and Wildlife Service through Tex Parks and Wildlife. So different partners came together to, to make this happen, including our Mexican partners, Terra, Cecilia Ambiental, and so they were the ones that actually conducted field work and punched some of the numbers I'm going to present to you today. Uh, it was a good partnership because uh, there was no way that me, myself, and I could go down there and be able to find out the status of the population and the habitat and the threats uh, for red contract. So the general objectives of this study were uh, what you see there, which were in, in a way very similar to the usual objectives for your study. Find out, uh, have an updated status of the population of red contract an updated status of the habitat, uh, not just the condition of the habitat, but also the use of that habitat by red parrots, and also have an updated uh, analysis of the threats that are affecting both the habitat and the species. Um, and we also wanted to find out some information about uh, what they are doing as far as feeding, boosting, uh, and really what the birds are doing. Uh, the latest, the last study, formal study, was conducted in the area was 25 years ago. And so we wanted to update that information to the best extent that we, that we could. And then once we had all this new information, all this updated info on the habitat, on the birds, on the threats, the next step uh, was to develop a conservation action. So once we know how the birds are doing, uh, then what is needed to be done in order to uh, support this uh, habitat and, and the species. And also part of, the, of this particular project was to implement the, some of the recommendations that came out of that conservation action. So let's, let's lead the way, once we have a conservation plan, let's lead the way and hopefully all of you will follow on to some of the uh, hardcore conservation actions that are needed order to uh, help the species. <clears throat> so the methodology was uh, fairly simple. Uh, it was uh, mostly through direct observations along plan six that were laid out uh, in the project area, which I'm gonna show you here in a second. So uh, field technicians went out and did uh, direct observations and documentation of the nests. Uh, they documented foraging and flying roosting parrots, they documented the food resources that were being used, the, the threats, and everything was your reference. Uh, this project took place between October 2017 and August of last year, and the project area is roughly 223,000 hectares uh, within four counties of four municipalities in, in Santa Tamaulipas. <laughs> That was the municipalities of Victoria, Güemes, Hidalgo, and Padilla. Uh, on to the results, what, what we found out. Uh, so I want you to keep in mind this, this Google Earth image. I'm going to show it to you uh, a few times with different information. A couple of things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, this is Ciudad Victoria, a huge urban city, the capital city of the state of Tamaulipas right here. And then right here, a very important landscape feature, which is the Sierra Madre Oriental that runs along Eastern Mexico, a good chunk of Mexico there. Uh, I also want you to keep in mind, this yellow polygon is the project area. This is a 223,000 hectare study area for the work. And the reason we chose that was because uh, as far as we know, this is where we have some knowledge of this being uh, histor having historical distribution of red crown carrots with, within this yellow polygon. And so what we found out over the last couple of years was that 
the getting distribution of red crown parrots within this polygon has reduced uh, considerably to just this white polygon. And so if this study area was 223,000 hectares, the current distribution is only about 97,000 hectares. And so what that means is that red crown parrots nowadays are occupied only about 40% of the original area that were uh, they were distributed. Um, a significant change. So one thing that, that we did there, uh, the, the estimate uh, for red crown parrots within this distribution area came out to be almost 800, uh, 1800 birds. And so this is a single point that, uh, a single number that we have at this point. We don't have any more points. Sadly, the data that was produced uh, some 25 years ago by the, the previous study was conducted in the area. We have some conflicts there as to the, the methodology, how their study was done, and how does it compare to what we did this time. Uh, and there are some confusing elements because the numbers that they came up with if we, if we took those, their numbers and these numbers that we found out, this means, this number now means that the population decline of red crown parrots here is over 90%. And we think it's, we think it's too much. So th there's, a, there's a lot of work that we need to do there. Maybe you go back to regional uh, researchers and find out, you know, what they did, how they did it, and compared their numbers to these numbers. And this is Ernesto Anchorman's Anchorman work down there in, in Central Tamaulipas. And so we're, we're flying with, with this number right here. Uh, we're really just taking this as, as a baseline number nowadays and, and just go with it in the future. Um, I'm not gonna there say that you know, the population decline has been 90% because we're not certain that that's really there is a lot of uh, certainty there to, to make such a bold statement. But what is true and, and, and what is what we know is that the area of distribution for the species has reduced, really reduced uh, considerably. Uh, and, and with that change in the distribution of the species, we can clearly see that about 77% of the land polygon, this yellow polygon has been cleared for different uses. And I'm gonna talk about that in, in a second. Uh, and only about 23% of the primary vegetation remains. And this vegetation remains, uh, is closely associated with the Sierra Madre Oriental, right here in the foothills of the Sierra Madre. Uh, and that's basically the area that the parks are using for different things. Um, Talking about how, how the birds are going as far as nesting, uh, again, you can clearly see the association of the vegetation associated with the Sierra Madre right here. Uh, all these little the icons that you see that represent some of the main uh, nesting sites that were located, documented in the study. Uh, and nesting zones are closely associated with recurring habitats that run along the edge of the Sierra Madre. Um, and also interestingly enough, I think this is something that you heard about last year. The, the tiny itty bitty town of Hidalgo right here, they found 72 nests in the main square in the middle of town. Uh, going back to what are we doing for birds in, in the movies setting. And so it seems like the population knows that the birds are there and they are somewhat protective. They are somewhat proud of their parrots and they don't allow or try to minimize the poaching of, of the parrots because it's just crazy. It's, it's, this is a tiny town, uh, you know, like many towns in Mexico with a central square, central plaza. And this is where the birds are nesting. And as far as we know, uh, this is, this site has the, the highest concentration of nesting red crown parrots in the world. <laughs> That's, and, and let somebody, 
somebody else tell me otherwise. That's a fact. <laughs> uh, but again, you know, um, going back to what the person are doing in, a, in an urban area like this, uh, which, by the way, doesn't compare, is not anywhere close to the urban <coughs> areas that we have here. Tiny little bit of town. With what the person are doing along the, the foothills of the Sierra Nevada and the Tata. <clears throat> Uh, 3D zones, so the birds down there are utilizing uh, some of the areas closer to the Sierra Madre. Again, I'm just highlighting the importance of the vegetation, the remnants of primary vegetation left here. And you can really see that here. Three main feeding areas were identified uh, within study areas. You see these three polygons, different colors. Uh, and the main species that the birds are utilizing Palma, Ficus, Texas Ebony, Tenasa, and Diente de Tigre. Not sure, I don't remember what species of this plant is. But anyway, so they are using all of these trees uh, in the foothills of the Sierra and also somewhat away from it in areas that still have some primary and secondary vegetation. Basically, just exploring uh, whatever they can find uh, food resources. Uh, where the birds are roosting, uh, then again, uh, in areas very close to the Sierra Madre, three main roost sites were identified. You see this larger red polygon, then there's a little blue poly polygon right here, and then uh, another one here. They also documented a couple of sites in the town of Padilla, which again goes back to, it's very clear that urban centers are providing some of the resources that these birds need to As far as the threats, the threats, uh, you know, are very distinct and, and very clear. What's happening? What's what has led to this uh, sixty percent reduction of vegetation, of climatic vegetation in this area? Uh, deforestation for agriculture uh, is the main driving factor. So there's a lot of farming, a lot of citrus cultivation, a lot of livestock livestock operations popping up everywhere. And all of that is taking out habitat that otherwise would be used by uh, red crown parrots and other you know, species. So uh, habitat change is by far the number one threat. Uh, land use change, the number one threat for species down there in, in Tamaulipas. Uh, along with poaching, poaching continues to be a huge problem. Um, that is, it's that it's been there for a long time, and as, unless something changes, it's going to continue to be a problem for red crowns and bull parrots. Uh, also, something else that was uh, mentioned by Simon, uh, a lot of the, the older trees, the mature trees that could be used as, as nesting trees are getting cut down. And the reason why that's happening in this part of the world is mostly because people are cutting them down to make carbon. And so that's, you know, that's an older added thread to that. So the more older trees are removed from, from the wild, from, from this area, the less nesting opportunities the birds are gonna have. And so that only adds to the stressors that are affecting the, the, the species. And then what you see here as tourism, tourism, this is seasonal tourism in some of the riparian areas for the birds of nesting. Uh, it is a, a tradition in Mexico, especially during falling weeks, some other signs that people like to go out and spend time outdoors. Some of the best places to go to include areas where there's a river, where there's a stream, and that just happened to be the sites for the birds of nesting. And in Holy Week is between March, April, which is smack in the middle of the breeding season. So the disturbance is creating a whole lot of uh, problems for the nesting birds uh, down there. And also uh, mining. Mining is taking place in some of the areas close to the Sierra. They are mining for different minerals and just the disturbance caused by the activities enough to, to disturb, uh, to affect the, the breeding uh, activity of the red plant. So after all of this was done, uh, you know, we now have a, a much better idea of what the birds are doing, 
what the habitat is doing, how the birds are using the, the habitat, and what the threats are. And so with all of that information, the next step was to develop the conservation action plan. So now we know what happened, but we, the conservation plan is telling us this is what we need to do in order to affect the, the conservation of the species in a positive way. And so we developed this conservation action plan for the species. Uh, the general objective, uh, very obvious, the conservation of the species and its habitat in this part of the world. And three main objectives to uh, that conservation plan included monitoring protection of the habitat, monitoring protection and improvement of the populations. But more than anything else, we want this. We want to ensure the long term conservation of the species and, and the habitat. Some very specific recommendations, and, and you know, just uh, think about this. This is a whole lot of work, and we're, we're dealing with the fact that we need a whole lot of resources and you know, to make things happen, to make change. And so, along along with the conservation plan, they also develop a, a business plan. Uh, and what a business plan is, it basically lays out the cost and the risk of making an investment. In conservation actions to improve the habitat for the species. Uh, and so, along with all of that, some very specific recommendations that came out of the plan include things like providing incentives for landowners and rural communities to provide alternative activities that are not as, as bad for the species or for the habitat. How do we work with those communities so that? People are not having to post the birds, that they are not having to clear the land, uh, that they are not having to log some of these older trees that are being used as, as nesting uh, for the birds. Uh, something that is important to you and, and that was mentioned here is that we need to amend environmental law in Mexico and support law enforcement. Right now, believe it or not, part of the law that is in the books is not helping those that are trying to enforce it uh, for different reasons. So this was a very bold statement that was laid out into this conservation plan because it's very obvious that if poaching is one of the main threats to the birds, we need to do more about you know, enforcing the law, about changing the law if it needs to, and, and it does. And so it's kind of like, you know, we're making a whole lot of progress here in Texas in, in terms of now we want to be able to enforce all of the laws uh, in favor of red content. So that is, that's a huge step that is already here and it's, it's hopefully making some progress. Uh, that is something that is not limited in Mexico as well. And then similar to uh, what is needed this year and, and everywhere else, continue with extensive public outreach and education campaigns, uh, billboards, and, and by the way, we had a billboard in, as part of this project. And, and went out to schools and talked to the public about the species, just trying to raise the conservation awareness of the species. Uh, something else that is, uh, came up as a recommendation is to organize communal watch groups. Many times what happens in the local communities, the poachers are not even people from those communities. They are coming from the outside and, and sneaking in and, and robbing the nests. And, and cutting the trees and doing all sorts of things. So again, this kind of goes back to uh, law enforcement and who's watching, and who's, who's keeping an eye out there. For them. And then this is key, uh, just like uh, Simon mentioned for the project here. We need to continue keeping an eye on the numbers, on the habitat, on the birds. You know, is, is this point, what is this point going to go? Future. Is it going to go down or is it going to go up? Is it going to be the same? We will not know that until we have that number uh, and we can generate that number. Uh, the key here, again, is that we now have a conservation action plan with very specific recommendations. To me, the saddest thing that can happen here is for this conservation plan to live in a bookshelf in somebody's house. We need to put it to action, just like with any other conservation plans. You know, that's great to have it, but nothing is going to happen unless something happens 
on the ground that is going to be a benefit to the species that we're trying. So for us, this is the next step. And it's a huge step because again, it comes with a with a huge price tag. And what is that on the ground? Well, we, we, we want to keep on looking. Uh, we need to keep on looking for sources of funding that can help the implementation of, of this conservation plan. Uh, and, and that's really the key to, to conservation. And so now I'm going to just show you some general uh, shots of uh, the project area, what you see here is uh, the Sierra Madre, the foothills of the Sierra Madre. The birds are using uh, for different activities. Uh, riparian areas associated with the, the foothills of the Sierra Madre. This is uh, a submontane corn scrub uh, that the birds are using for roosting for the most part. The assumption that is that they are finding some protection in this stuff, so they are using that as the preferred roosting sites. Uh, and then this is what this uh, vegetation looks like in the inside. We're talking about the palm trees and very large vegetation. Again, the, the field techs uh, conducting the work, documenting different things. Uh, some of the samples of the, the three species that birds are using uh, for nesting. This is platanus. I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's platanus. Oh. There you go. Uh, oak trees. And uh, this is actually a picture of a poached uh, nest, a poached cavity. So, what the, the, the poachers do, they come in and find the empty hole. Instead of trying to reach in for the birds at the base of this cavity, they just dig a hole right here. And so, what you see here, this is the entry hole for the birds, birds somewhere up here. This is what they so basically made a more hole to get to the tree. And uh, one of the things that we did as part of this project, again, was to go out to uh, some of the local schools. Uh, with the objective of raising awareness of the species, the value of the species, and this never-ending process of you know trying to educate the public about why the species is important and why it's maybe not such a good idea to have a, a, a pet parrot at home, uh, you know, all those things. And that's all I have. What is going on here? Sorry, here. Oh, here. Uh, here. This is, I've never been to Seattle. Or is there other parks in other areas? There are. There are. Um, and that is a good question. Yeah, well, I, I thought, but I think it can you repeat the question before you answer it, just so I can hear? Thanks. Well, the question was, why are the birds nesting in the tiny itty-bitty town of Hidalgo and not so much in Ciudad Victoria, which is a much bigger urban area? Okay. So initially, I think, wonder, is there some kind of event that causes one, one or two birds to start nesting here? And the other nearby parents learn from them? Yeah. So you would see like a really monumental and the our birds on the river was that that creature that feeds that the habitat that created that habitat that feeder are also probably the birds that are in the city. We see that with the phone calls and the agency strategy. Because it's 
It's a good question and a good point. You know, one time it was presented and I was thinking about, you know, most of the birds that we, that we saw down there, we could consider them rural birds, not so much urban birds. Why is that? With the exception of this little time. And so, you know, I'm thinking that maybe they are not nesting or occupying this urban area in Tamaulipas so much because of one thing, culture. A whole lot more people closer to where the birds are, and so the risk, the chances of nests getting close, much higher. That, that's just my point. Uh, and, and again, you know, the difference between, I'm not there saying the difference between Ciudad Victoria right here and this time in the town is that the people in this town, they know that the birds are there. And, and there's a sense of ownership and protection. I bet you if there is a baseball team there, I wouldn't be surprised if they if they are the great right from parents or they grow in Spanish. But the, I would say that's a that's a difference. But to your point, you know, biologically, what's happening in the species? You know, are, are, is there something that is being passed on from the adults to the future generations of the birds that is telling them this is safe, this is not? Uh, stay here, don't go there. That's a good question. Or oh, the question is, are there any records of Nesting happening in Ciudad Victoria. Uh, I don't know. I, I do not know. That's the only thing that's not happening. Find out what they could do with the microphone. Anything else for Mexicans? Yeah. Uh, I believe in that. I have a 20 door area. This is for just for the area. This is just for this white polygon you see here. That uh, is where we found the birds are. And, and you know, something to kind of keep in mind, I guess, in this number here, sometimes here in South Texas, you hear people say that you know, Rio Grande Valley has more birds than their compares than Mexico. Uh, that's not the case. I know you're not, but I, I've heard people in, in recent days. Whatever. I've got a question. Um, Go ahead, Don. When you say that you've got 12 roosts in one area and 13 roosts in another, are those 12 roosts that are all active at the same time, or do you have one group of birds rotating among 12 different locations? They, they were all active at the same time. Okay, so how many birds on average are you seeing in one of these roosts? What's a big roost there? What's a small roost there? Uh, according to the numbers, the, some of the smallest roosts included 10 to 20 birds. And I think the largest roost that was documented was over 300 birds. Over so 300, the, you said? Yes, 300. Okay, and and every, every, everything in between, so. Yeah. Right. And you estimated your total population by kind of getting a feel for how many birds were using each roost. Is that correct? This was a single count, a single event that, that was conducted during the winter. They had uh, people spread out across the, the, the known roosting sites that had been documented. And that's how this, this number was generated. Okay, great. Thanks. Sure.